public discussions on the issue of health and food in conjunction with the Nutrition and Health Conference by the University of Arizona's Center for Integrative Medicine. I'm Tara LeMay, and I will be the curator of this evening's discussion. Our format, for those of you who have been here before, you know it is conversational. I'll be introducing our panelists. Dr. Weil will provide some opening remarks and commentary, and then we'll spend the next couple of hours sort of delving into the issues and sort of exploring both our health and well-being, our food, what we can do personally, and then what do we need to do systemically and in our society to make better changes. Later in the discussion, we'll have the audience join us at the um, mics, and we'll talk a little bit more about that then. For those of you who are Twitterers in the audience, we have a hashtag for you. It's uh, eat well, post often, Twitter frequently, and sort of get the word out there for all of us. Twitter. Um, so with that, let me introduce our panelists, although they need very little introduction. Next to me is Dr. Andrew Weil, who is an internationally recognized leader in integrative medicine, an expert in medical education, medical botany, and mind-body interactions. He has an AB degree in, bi in biology botany from Harvard College and an MD from Harvard Medical School. He's a best-selling author on health um, based in integrative medicine and medical philosophy. I know you know him from his various appearances on magazines and Larry King and other places. <laughs> Next to him is Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who's an Emmy Award-winning Chief Medical Correspondent for the Health and Medical and Wellness Unit at CNN. In addition to his work for CNN, he's a member of the staff and faculty at Emory University School of Medicine, and he serves as a diplomat of the American Board of Neurosurgery and a member of the board of the Lance Armstrong Live Strong Foundation. Next to him is Dr. David Kessler. He's the author of The End of Overeating, which we all need. Um, David served as a commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration under Presidents George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. He's a pediatrician and has been the dean of the medical schools at Yale and the University of California, San Francisco, a graduate of Amherst College, University of Chicago Law School, and Harvard Medical School. And as I learned recently, also a dumpster diver. But we'll talk more about that later. <laughs> So to, to open the uh, comments for tonight, I'd like to talk to Andy. Andy, you wrote a book on why our health matters, and in it you said we have a right to good health care, the health care that's effective, accessible, and affordable. But our health is far from the best in the world. We rank 37th in health outcomes on par with Serbia. Meanwhile, our costs are twice the high, high, as high per capita than other developed nations. So given that we've spent the last year and a half dealing with health care reform or insurance reform, perhaps. Um, why do you think, uh, how, will we end up with better health care, and why do nutrition and integrative medicine matter? Uh, well, I have to tell you that I found the, the health care reform debate infinitely depressing. Uh, I am glad that we have a bill. I think it would be much worse if we didn't have one. Uh, but I think there's very little in that bill that addresses the roots of our problem, which is that health care in America costs way too much, and that we can't contain those costs. And uh, really, as you said, this, is not, this bill was not about health care reform, it's about health insurance reform. We desperately need health care reform. And the main problem is to figure out how to make health care affordable, how to bring the cost down, and also to improve our dismal health outcomes. There is a bit of language in this bill, um, and a lot of it thanks to Senator Harkin of Iowa, about prevention and even about integrative medicine, but it's such a tiny percentage of the language in the bill. And um, as you've heard me say, I think the reasons that healthcare in America costs so much, uh, the first is that we only give lip service to prevention and health promotion. So this whole massive enterprise is about intervention and established disease, uh, the great majority of which is lifestyle related and therefore preventable. And a lot of that is rooted in our awful eating habits and uh, a subject that we're gonna talk about tonight. And the other reason is that the interventions that we have come to favor in conventional medicine are dependent on costly technology, and I include pharmaceutical drugs in that category. Uh, one of the uh, questions I always ask audiences, and something that I always teach to our trainees in integrative medicine, uh, is to really think about how we got into the habit of thinking that the only legitimate way to treat disease was by giving drugs. Um, I think the the great problem is that our health professionals are not trained to use low to the many low tech. Uh, low-cost interventions that are available, and among those are lifestyle interventions, such as teaching people how to eat better. 
So I was very fortunate. I got to talk to Andy last week while I was laying on the floor, and a doctor wanted to give me a shot in my spine. And Andy said, keep breathing, it'll pass, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. <laughs> and so, so I consider that uh, an important part of the intervention. Um, Sunday, was, that, was that keep breathing, it will pass? I just want to make <laughs> yeah, No, that's good. Another one is call me when it gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> Sanjay, what do you think about um, what came out of healthcare reform and sort of why does it matter that we talk about nutrition and, and sort of other mechanisms? Well, you know, Andy and I talked a fair amount about this on panels and stuff uh, when, when healthcare reform was going on. And, you know, I, I think Andy makes some very, very good points, I think important points. And there's no question that we've evolved into this, this disease management society as opposed to a health promotion society. And the irony of it is that I think everybody wants, you know, the health promotion part of society. But so many disincentives have been sort of built into the system, which is what I think Dr. Weil is referring to, and a lot of those disincentives towards creating more health uh, have not really been addressed. Some of it is, you know, um, I think uh, not anybody in particular's fault, uh, you know, to try to avoid finger pointing here. But nevertheless, you know, if you look at trying to project 10, 20, 30 years down the road, unless we address some of those, those root problems, um, you know, I think we're still going to very much be in the same boat. I think, you know, some of the, th I, I was encouraged by a few things. You know, the, 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 the idea that we're still in medicine, I think surprisingly, there's a lot of things we simply don't know uh, about what works, what doesn't work, whether it be medications, like Dr. Wow was talking about, procedures, um, certain types of screening tests. We've seen a lot of uh, outcry recently over mammography and when mammography should be started, for example. And I think that that sort of speaks to the point that, you know, we, there's a lot that we don't know still. And I think as part of trying to, to aggregate more information from around the country, look at uh, patients, what, what seems to benefit them, what doesn't, we are going to sort of gradually, I think, raise the bar toward creating uh, more of that health promotion. But, and, and I think that that may, may occur in part as part of this bill. But, um, yeah, I, I think I was, I was um, sort of moderately pleased. That, you, people always say, and, perfect is the enemy of good. Uh, something is better than nothing. Those are the adages you often hear as a bill gets closer and closer to possibly passing. You know, I, I think that that's true, but, but not, not completely. I think, you know, there's still, still some work to be done. I've never encountered a perfect bill in Washington. Right. <laughs> so I'm fairly sure that we probably got as far as we could, but on to the next adventure, I suppose, with healthcare. Um, speaking of Washington, today, and I don't know how many of you in the audience saw Michelle Obama's announcement today on childhood obesity. Anybody? Very few. You were all at the conference. Um, <laughs> so that's not about Jamie Oliver. Oh, so, and how many of you watched Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution? Uh -huh. <laughs> Whoa! So, um, so I, I'm a longtime Tedster, and Jamie won the Ted Prize. Um, and I got to be there to talk to him afterwards. We invited him here, but he couldn't make it. Um, I watched the whole show, and I have to say I was appalled um, by both the lack of knowledge people had about food and how um, the system is working against even people who want to do well. Um, I think it's... I think it's fascinating, um, both of them, and I'd love to know, you know, David, maybe you can share some of your thoughts first with us, because you dealt with sort of what are the root causes of some of this, and maybe you guys can jump in. And So the question is, if you just look at the data, this is a problem that we had relatively under control in the 1960s and 1970s. And if you look at weight back then, you see that adult weight was relatively stable over a lifetime. And I'll show the graphs tomorrow, but the, you, your um, weight, you, gained, you entered your 20s, you gained a few pounds, relatively flat from your 20s, you know, from your 20s, 30s, 40s, you lost a few pounds in your 60s and 70s. That was what the curve looked like for adult weight uh, back three, four decades ago. Today you enter your adult years, on average, about 18 pounds heavier if you're a male, a little less for a female. And you keep on gaining weight um, until you're 50 uh, plus. So this is something that's happened in the last three, four decades. Right? And the question is, what was it? What's driving it? It certainly is not our genes. Right? I mean, that, that, they don't change 
uh, in that uh, period of time. And the consequences are enormous. Now, uh, back, um, if you look, uh, about 10 years ago, there were four cases of type 2 diabetes per thousand, something like that, approximately. Today, that number has more than doubled. Back in the year 2000, we spent $7 billion a year as a country on drugs for diabetes. Um, today, we spend in excess of $13 billion on drugs and other care for diabetes. So the, the consequences, I mean, if you look at those graphs, and it still has not plateaued, um, it doesn't portend very well for this country. And the question is, what's driving it? Um, and what's at that root cause? So, what is <laughs> what's it? What's the answer? You know the answer. <laughs> so, I mean, so if you look at the business plan of the modern American, excuse me, the global food company, I mean, what, what really has it been, right? It's to take fat, sugar, and salt, to put it on every corner, to make it available 24-7, to make it socially acceptable to eat any time, day or night. We used to eat back in the 60s and 70s during meals. You know, today, we took the, we've taken down those, uh, those boundaries. There's even a tagline, what, Taco Bell is the fourth meal, right? Uh, we've made food into entertainment. Right? We've added the emotional gloss of advertising. Look at the taglines. You'll love it, happiness. And we've, um, we're living, in essence, in a food carnival. Go look at, I mean, go watch people eat I mean, at a mall. Right? It's literally a food carnival. What did we think was going to happen if we took fat, sugar, and salt and put it on every corner? Well, uh you know, even the hobbits ate second breakfast. So <laughs> maybe back in Middle Earth, we, we had multiple meals. May I comment? Yeah, of course. Um, let, let me comment on what I see as obstacles to health care reform, which apply to yep. food reform. Um, as dysfunctional as the American health care system is, and it is very dysfunctional, it is generating rivers of money that are flowing into very few pockets. And those pockets are the big pharmaceutical companies, the manufacturers of medical devices, and the big insurers. They do not want change. They control our legislators. The amounts of money they spend for lobbying are overwhelming. For that reason, I don't see any chance of real health care reform coming from politicians. It cannot come from bureaucrats. The only way it's going to come is if there is a grassroots movement in this country that eventually changes the balance of political power. If you look at the problem with food, it's very similar. It's all very well for Michelle Obama to be having a campaign against obesity, but at the same time, the federal government continues to drive down the prices of high fructose corn syrup and refined soybean oil, which are chief culprits in all of this manufactured and addictive food. And we allow unrestricted advertising of this terrible stuff to kids and make it very attractive. It seems to me that if we're going to get serious about these things, we have to take on those vested interests. And I don't see, again, I do not see that coming from our elected politicians at the moment. I think it's got to come from some other route. Well, it seemed, at least in the food revolution, it seemed really interesting to watch the um, the administrators really stuck in a bind because at one point they would try to take out the sweetened strawberry milk and then they would say, but we want them to have milk. They would try to take out, they would try to have cooked vegetables, but by weight, the french fries were a lot more. They filled the whole cup and a cooked vegetable becomes a quarter of a cup. There are policies that seem to be in place on the industrial side and the cost issues that are, are working in uh, counterbalance to this. And, you know, I think it's interesting because on one side people are saying take personal responsibility and yet on the other side, systemically, it seems to be a challenge. So, you know, I know leaving that program, I, many Americans, my guess, was saying, what do we do? Sanjay, have you heard from viewers on this? Well, I mean, I, I think that there's sort of two, two, two issues here. You know, I think uh, Dr. Weil sort of alluding to this idea that, that um, because of certain governmental pressures, it has filtered down into all sorts of decisions which subsequently influence the food choices that we have and make because some of the food choices are just easier. And the other part of it from the, from the sort of coming up from the, from, the, from the other side is this idea that 
uh, unhealthy food is, is cheaper as a result. So, you know, if you're living near the poverty line uh, and you have a family of five and you're making nineteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year, McDonald's all of a sudden is a pretty good bargain. You get a lot of calories for relatively cheap. So, you know, this idea that you want to make uh, unhealthy foods more expensive, for example, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because if you just think of it that way, you're penalizing exactly the wrong people. But, you know, I, I guess the question is what, if, if, if that, if that, if the issue is you're sort of outlining it is true, then why can't we have healthier foods be the, be the metric of competition as opposed to, as you say, driving down the cost of corn, driving down the cost of soybeans? David, don't you feel that everything's stacked against individuals? It's, it, you know, it is everything stacked against us. So, so what do we, I mean, let, let's just stay with that, that yeah. notion of what, is, what does that mean? I mean, I, I do believe that if you can get if you understand overeating, um, you will understand um, what drives many of our impulses, obsessions, uh, uh, compulsions, and our human behaviors. I mean, in, in reality, you know, I mean, food was, and sex, was the first addiction. Right? I mean, we needed it um, to survive. And if you look, and I think we don't realize it, and I don't think we've had the science, but food is much more powerful than we realize. I used to think I was eating um, to, uh, you know, for nutrition. I thought I was eating for satisfaction. I thought I was eating to fill myself up. Um, you know, only when you, you really dig into the science do you realize um, that what I was doing, and I have suits in every size, um, is, um, is, is really, I was, it was just self-stimulation. I mean, fat, sugar, and, fat and sugar, fat and salt, fat, sugar, and salt stimulate us uh, to eat more. I mean, understand what we did as a country. Back in the 1930s and the 1940s, in order to feed a, you know, a hungry nation, we, we revolutionized food processing. There were a lot of advantages to food processing. We were able to ship food over longer distances, food became uh, cheaper, even certain food safety, shelf life was longer. What did the food industry learn to do? It learned to dial in fat, sugar, and salt uh, into uh, that food. But it's not just the fat, sugar, and salt that's stimulating us. Yes, it is, and, and yes, you could see um, the activation of our brains and, and why it drives uh, wanting, not, not just liking. But the fact is, you know, we, we are more vulnerable than we realize, but we've, you can't walk down a block in this city or in any other city, more than 10 feet, without having your brain bombarded with some food cue. And for the millions of Americans who are sensitive to those food cues, I mean, that, you know, uh, to some people that's just neutral, you know, advertising. To other people, that's activating their brain circuits and setting off thoughts of wanting in a whole cycle. So we are much more vulnerable than we realize, I mean, as a species. So should we do something to restrict that kind of advertising? Well, you, 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 you take, take a vote. Um, you know, you take a vote here now. Um, and you have to realize over the next 20 years, that issue, I think, will be one of the one of the uh, important issues in front of the Supreme Court. We've always taken you know, a belief in this country that advertising was speech right? and was information. And the way you deal with information in this country is you give more information, not less information. Um, and that's the way we certainly you know, uh, deal with political speech and, and commercial advertising. The question is, you know, for certain stimuli, um, is advertising just neutral speech? Or in fact, does it amplify the reinforcing potential of the stimulus? And I think the evidence is pretty clear for certain uh, stimuli, uh, fat, sugar, and salt, nicotine, other things, um, that advertising um, acts as certain cues, I mean, and really does um, stimulate us in ways that we're only beginning to understand. Well, on the speech issue, the U.S. treats children differently because you can't advertise certain things to children. We treat them quite differently from a, po uh, a free speech and a privacy perspective. So the part of the question is, should we restrict the advertising to children? 
The second question, though, I think maybe is more important. Um, the government regulators are now looking at the salt intake, just like they've looked at trans fats and other things. Should we be restricting the amounts of things, particularly in packaged goods, foods, it was labeling it enough, or is the restriction what matters? I know, Sanjay, you just did a piece on this, the sodium issue. Mm -hmm. Do you have some thoughts about this? Yeah, you know, uh, first of all, I'm a little hesitant to, to place nicotine in the same category as, as fat, salt, and sugar. I, I just think, I've always thought nicotine has absolutely no redeeming qualities. And I always get a little bit skittish when, when trying to all of a sudden put fat, salt, and sugar in that same category. With regard to sodium in particular, um, some of the data is pretty compelling, and I think it becomes one of these situations where if we can, uh, if people know uh, just how much of an impact sodium makes on an individual's body, how many deaths in any given year, according to the study out of Stanford, which is oft quoted now, uh, could be prevented as a result of reducing sodium, and how early in life that whole process starts, that, uh, um, you know, I think that could have a significant impact. We also know that, that the amount of salt in foods varies between countries significantly. And as far as taste goes uh, with, with regard to some of these foods, uh, depending on where you were born, the types of foods that you ate your whole life, the types of foods that were prepared in your, your kitchen or sold restaurants near you, uh, your craving or desire for as much salt uh, is different. So I think it, it can be dealt with, I think, in a, in a fairly uh, logical fashion. Also, you know, the food labeling, you know, when you go to Red Lobster, I read this the other day, the Admiral's Feast, Admiral's Feast has 7.1 grams of sodium in, in one dish, and they say the, the amount should be closer to two grams in an entire day for an adult. So right there you have two and a half or three and a half times uh, the amount of salt needed. Um, David's book argues very persuasively that uh, fat, salt, and sugar and these combinations that we produced really are comparable to nicotine and know. other reinforcing drugs, that they affect our brains in the same way. And, you know, the, the effect that this is having in our population is leading us to the brink of real disaster. The, the type 2 diabetes epidemic that is following the epidemic of childhood obesity has the potential to sink us economically. The Defense Department said a couple of weeks ago that the pool of applicants available for military service is threatened by the obesity epidemic. So this will become a matter of national security. You know, maybe this changes how we look at these things. So, so we have, I think we have, do have to be careful. I mean, there are similarities and there are differences. Right? But, you know, I, I was asked to give a talk to a, um, a global food manufacturer. And let me, just, let me just give you some of the similarities, and then we can talk about some of the differences. Nicotine is a moderately reinforcing chemical. I mean, if you look, rats will, they'll press a lever, but it's not, um, it's not the most uh, reinforcing of chemicals. Add to that nicotine, right, other stimuli. Add the smoke, the, uh, the throat scratch, the cellophane crinkling of the pack, the color of uh, the pack, the image of the cowboy, the emotional gloss of the advertising that it was cool, sexy, uh, to smoke. What did we do? We took a reinforcing chemical, added these other stimuli, um, and added the emotional gloss of, of how we perceived the, the product, and we ended up with a deadly, highly addictive product. I give you a package of sugar and say, go have a good time. You're going to say, what are you talking about? Right? Add to that sugar, because sugar is reinforcing. I mean, add to that sugar fat, add texture, add mouthfeel, add color. Chocolate. Add right. chocolate. Right. <laughs> add the emotional gloss of advertising. Make it into entertainment. Right. So you, you start off with a stimuli and you add these multi-sensory aspects to it and you, you add these levels and, and there's no question that you see that the circuits of the brain, the learning, memory, motivational and habit circuits of the brain Right, are activated by you know a whole host of stimuli by either th that um, that nicotine or by that uh, fat sugar multisensory kind of combination. The, I mean, in some ways, tobacco was easy, right? Because you can live without tobacco, and so we were able to demonize it. I mean, and that's how that's how we really uh, succeeded. Food is much harder because we need food um, uh, to live. Uh, but when you really look at the reinforcing potential, I mean, they're, they're I think we've underestimated how powerful 
a stimulus, certainly this, this refined processed food has become. Now the practical problem that I encounter and that many of my colleagues encounter is that when we try to teach people about making healthy food choices, most people perceive this as giving up everything they like. And they see a, an opposition between food that's good for you and food that gives you pleasure. And that is a, it is awfully difficult to give people the experience that you can have both together. But most people have never experienced that, and their experience of pleasureful reinforcing food is the, is the refined processed manufactured stuff. You know, so, so you ask yourself, I mean, why, and I think this is probably too, when you, you know, when, when you look, you know, when do people tend to overeat? Right? I mean, it's later in the day. I mean, um, at, it's at night, right? Um, and it's in private, um, and you, you see, you know, I mean, it's self -medi we're self-medicated, right? I mean, it, 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 it activates certain circuits. You're, you're sitting there. You're, um, you know, it's very pleasurable, and you're using it. I mean, to to deal with stress. <coughs> But it's, it's really interesting. I mean, all of you guys who watch Food Revolution will clearly remember Jamie Oliver cutting the good parts off the chicken, putting the fat and the bones in the blender, making the chicken McNuggets, and the seven-year-olds with great delight wanting the most disgusting thing ever made in front of them. And I think it's fascinating because um, once it became a nugget, it was something to be excited about. And it didn't matter that they could see things ahead of it. So I think that's starting to, it, it's this conflict that we're talking about, about right. our desire on one side, and can education overcome that, which is the American way. We like to use information to counter negative information. Or do we have a bigger problem? And you know, it's not clear from what we're saying here, what's the right mix? Because it's not going to be one or the other, but sort of how do we take that on? You know, how do we take it on when the amusement parks, one of the major amusement parks, will spray um, uh, cinnamon and sugar out in the air about 100 yards before you reach the stand that's selling you the, uh, you know, donut with that. So it's preparing you to have it. Um, There's no question that people eat what's cheapest and most available. And we have made the unhealthiest, most obesity-promoting food cheapest and most available. So certainly one strategy to consider is making that food more expensive and less available. That is certainly something we have to consider. The, the, uh, first of all, with regards to nicotine, just because, you know, we, we, I, I think the point that I, that I was trying to make was not so much that there aren't some similarities, but I think, again, I think with nicotine, tobacco, and the sort of cascade of, you know, events, the packaging, all that around it, absolutely has no redeeming qualities. There's nothing good about it. It, it kills people. And right. to somehow equate food, I think, in some way with that, I think is a dangerous precedent because of what it might lead to. Um, now, if you're dealing with some of the stuff, that assumes that much of what we're eating is food. <laughs> Well, we, 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 but, but again, the goal, I think, is not to demonize food, but to make healthier food more the norm. I mean, it, what, 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 I, what I don't fully understand, I think, is that are you saying we're sort of unwitting hedonists who, are, who fall, you know, easily prey to, to advertising and all that? I mean, on one hand, you say food has been one of the earliest addictions. On the other hand, in the 70s, we were sort of flat in terms of in terms of our, so, our, our weight. So something over the last 30, 40 years has, we, has turned this primal addiction into something that's killing we, us. We had certain boundaries.